My talk is titled The Avnet, Wrestling with the Divine in Syrian Jewish Mexico City. Um, as Dr. Gordon um, mentioned, uh, my book, the, the uh, manuscript is in progress is a linguistic ethnography of young adult Syrian Lebanese Jews in Mexico City. It's a community I've been doing field work in for a long time. Um, about my own positionality, I'm a North American Jewish individual with a Baghdadi Jewish descent, but certainly not a member of, of a Syrian Jewish community. Um, but um, so in no way claim to speak on behalf of, of the individuals whom I'm representing here, but was fortunate enough to um, be welcomed into homes and communal spaces to be able to do this research. Um, the book in general in, explores processes of identity and life decisions through a focus on language and discourse, and particularly use of the Spanish language, which is, of course, the vernacular of most Latin American Jews in Spanish-speaking countries. Um, <clears throat> the presentation today is from what is going to be the third chapter, and this is really the chapter in which I'm hoping to engage a broader U.S college students among other audience and create empathy with my research participants, so I appreciate your feedback in that regard. Okay, times are difficult in the Holy Land. The sect of the extreme Orthodox takes control of the students of the Yeshivot. Their leader, Chacham Darth Cohen, takes the rights of religion to the extreme, betraying the teachers of his master, Yola Abraham, which is Yola. Reform and conservative Jews try to create resistance to this new dark wave of fear that captures the minds of young Jews from their birth. A war of ideology and thought is imminent. The creation of a massive school of hate and racism frightens the Council of Kabbalists, who choose a select group to fight against this new evil force and restore peace and unity among the people of Israel. So reads the opening crawl of the short film, Jewish Wars, 2008, by then 21-year-old Syrian Jewish Mexican filmmaker Salomon Askenazi. A spoof on Star Wars, it uses dubbed footage of the original to portray an epic battle between David, aka Luke Skywalker, and Darth Cohen, aka Vader. Cohen is the head of the Shiva Gedola, through which he seeks to force his extremist religion on all Jews of the universe. David is a young Kabbalist committed to fight for the right to practice Judaism his own way. He teams up with Chacham Sedlovich, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Rab Solo, Han Solo, to study the esoteric text of the Zohar with Kabbalah master Yola Abraham. En route, their spacecraft gets sucked into Cohen's massive ship where Karen Bar Yohai, who is Princess Leia, is being held captive. David rescues Karen, but Chacham Sedlovich is killed in battle with Darth Cohen, and the film ends here. Throughout the eight minutes, the film alternates between scenes of Darth Cohen and his minions discussing things like how to force all Jews to drink kosher water, which we're going to see in a moment, to scenes of David and his companions denouncing Darth Cohen's plots and extolling a more humanist expression of Judaism. At the same time, as it broaches these serious subjects, it's also very funny with prolific insider human humor and verbal play. Jewish Mexican viewers instantly recognize the film as a critique of the pervasive local influence of transnational ultra-Orthodox movements. Such movements have evolved in recent decades into a major organizing and polarizing force in Jewish Mexico City. Schools and synagogues have emerged that, while still under the auspices of one of the main communal institutions, distinguish themselves as more strictly observant, and this phenomenon has been most pronounced within the Aleppo or Halabi community. By employing the metaphor of intergalactic warfare, Salomon Askenazi aptly conveys the high stakes involved in local contestation over Jewish religiosity. And for the filmmaker, these stakes were quite personal, as I'll explore momentarily. Salomon Askenazi's work is just one expression of the multiple stances that young Syrian Jewish Mexicans adopt with regards to Haredi amid other styles of religiosity. Today, in addition to delving into his use of film to craft this stance, I'll be profiling a few other young Jewish people with whom I've worked in Mexico City, engaged in similar processes. Across varying individual stances, some common threads emerge. These include a commitment to a personally honest and meaningful spirituality, and a robust spirit of critique in evaluating various models available to them. The spirit of critique is something that Foucault, 1984, in his reading of Kant, celebrates as quintessentially modern. Here, I draw attention to this quality of critical engagement and 
of questioning, challenging, negotiating, selecting, and blending, and characterizing it using the Hebrew word le'avek, to wrestle, to struggle. This is the word that described the biblical Yaakov struggle with his angel in order to become Israel in the Torah portion of Eishla. This focus uh, on struggle is consistent with the contemporary anthropological commitment of emphasizing individual agency in the study of religion, constrained as it is by social structure. Such attention to agency is particularly important when we're talking about people who are commonly dismissed as being backwards or unmodern, which is unfortunately often the case with Syrian Lebanese and other, other Jews from the Middle East, North Africa. Um, and this, this dismissal is, is prominent um, among other Jews who are not of these backgrounds. In both popular, popular and academic discourse, Sephardi and Arab Jewish religiosities are often painted in broad essentialist strokes for their centuries-old reputation of religious devotion, Syrian Jews in particular can be either denigrated as superstitious and fanatical, or romanticized as pious and pure. And I encountered these beliefs frequently among Ashkenazim in, in Mexico City. Within the academic field of Jewish studies, um, the foundational text on Sephardi and Israeli religiosity in the modern era was Norman Silvan's Sephardi religious responses to modernity. And in the book, he contrasts responses of Ashkenazi rabbis with those of their Sephardi counterpoints, uh, counterparts, and emphasizes the Sephardi rabbi's uh, relative flexibility, which he argues enabled a, a degree of communal cohesion despite variation in observance. The notion of Sephardi traditionalism has proven good to think for scholars, as it seems to encapsulate an idealized happy medium in which Jewish tradition and secular modernity, air quotes, can fruitfully exist. Um, however, other more recent historiographical studies, such as those by Goldberg and Harrell, have demonstrated that there were very orthodox responses among um, Middle Eastern and North African rabbis, including 11 rabbis. And furthermore, although certainly not Stillman's intent, traditional has become a reductive shorthand for labeling the religiosity of Sephardi and Middle Eastern Jews, and it often denotes a, a natural or unconscious mode of, of engagement with religion. So in this context, it's very important to foreground the deliberations and purposeful actions that young Shami and Halabi Mexicans take in deciding their religious trajectory, especially at this juncture. And I choose the term Le'avec in part because it is sort of made, you know, reflecting a, a, it's a biblical term, but it is a struggle, but not just any struggle, but a sacred one. Not one between belief and disbelief or religion versus modernity, those persistent binaries of modernist and assimilationist paradigms, but rather the struggle is one of negotiating familial, ultra-Orthodox, and other influences and defining and learning, earning legitimacy for their own religiosity. And in my conclusions, I'll return to discuss how this contributes on contemporary theorizing on religiosity and secularization, and especially theorizing that comes out of both um, anthropology and Mexican social theory. Okay, a bit of history, which fortunately we've already heard from the previous panel in terms of <coughs> Jewish migration to Mexico City. Um, most dates to the early 20th century. The, the migration of um, Jews from Ottoman, former Ottoman territories occurred earlier in general than the Ashkenazi migrations. And um, communities started out in the Mexico City's central, um, uh, Centro Historico. Um, many people in marketing and they retailing and retail and, um, and textiles. This is a picture of one of the, the oldest synagogues. And as the previous presenters mentioned, um, although the first Jewish institution from 1912 represented all uh, Jews of all backgrounds, they quickly separated into different communal institutions based on origins, religious right, and language. Language was certainly an important axis of, of communal organization. Of course, Arabic being the main language of, the, of the, those from Syria and Lebanon, and Latino, those of, um, from other Ottoman territories, and Yiddish and other European languages of the Ashkenazi. So this sort of, the, the, the four main institutional structures really come from this, this time in the 20s and 30s, and they, they remain the most important sort of pillars of communal organization today. Um, <coughs> the big four, as I tend to refer to them, are the Kehila Ashkenazi, the Comunidad Separadí, Comunidad Monte Sinai, who represents those from Damascus and Beirut, or the Shamis, and the Comunidad Marin David, who represent the Halabis, or those from Aleppo. Collectively, these um, represent nearly 40%, and actually I think the current um, estimate is that um, sort of non-Ashkenazim constitute about 60% of the Jewish community of Mexico City, which is between 38,000 and 40,000 people. 
So it's a unique community in terms of the large proportion of Sephardi and Middle Eastern Jews. Um, and the remainder that's not uh, represented here are either unaffiliated or affiliated with other Jewish institutions like the Centro Deportivo Israelita, um, or there is a, a conservative Masorti congregation as well. So within these communities, um, several recent trends make it uh, interesting for study of, of religiosity. Um, there's been a shifting balance of demographic um, and, and other kinds of presence um, from Ashkenazi to Khalidi and Shami, whereas Ashkenazi were once numerically and, and politically dominant. This is no longer necessarily the case. These groups were once very separate. Now there's plenty of intermarriage. Um, and Shami and Khalidi are, are departing from uh, established family patterns of joining family businesses, marrying young, um, and attending university. And all of this is in this context of growing the growing Haredi peasants that I mentioned in my introduction. These, of course, are, are couched in broader trends at the national and regional levels. Um, part of the reason for pursuing new uh, educational and economic trajectories is that the economy has shifted substantially, whereas family businesses based on manufacturing or, or textiles were very profitable and could sustain entire extended families and, and for a large part of the 20th century, that's no longer the case in the context of, of neoliberal economic policy. And there's, of course, threats to um, security um, via organized crime, the drug war. Um, at the same time, there is this shift from what we heard about the uh, nationalist ideologies based on mestizaje, based on this idealized mixing of European and indigenous, um, a shift from that towards official discourses of pluralism, which is, of course, occurring, has occurred across Latin America. And Jews have successfully worked within these campaigns to bring greater visibility to the community and greater public representation and insert themselves into um, national narratives. <coughs> so now more than ever, young Shami and Khalidis have choices. Um, choices about if they want to pursue a college education, where, what they want to study, and this is particularly novel with regards to women. Uh, choices who they, uh, who they want to marry, it's not limited to people from your own community anymore. And choices about how religious they want to be and what kind of religiosity they want to have. So today that's the, the focus of my presentation. The first time I met Salomon Askenazi was in Starbucks in 2008. The last time, and he of course is one person who I name because he's a, you know, a growing filmmaker and he's, he's well recognized and I have permission to use his real name in my publications. Uh, the last time, the most recent time we met was in 20, 2017 in his own cafe, which is called Quentin after his favorite filmmaker, Quentin Tarantino. The cafe is in the hip Colonia Roma, now hip Colonia Roma, and the adjacent building house his production studio, which is called Bosporosente. Askenazi has produced three feature-length films by this point and has been nominated for several awards, and he's now also married and the father of a young daughter. In 2008, however, he was just starting out. Jewish Wars was one of his first productions. He grew up in a holiday family. All four of his grandparents migrated to Mexico from Aleppo. He was raised in Mexico City, but had lived for a period of time in Florida, although his parents returned, according to Askenazi, because of the lack of religious cohesion and general level of observance in in South Florida, who remembers being looked at strangely because he was the only Jewish family that kept kosher. And this kind of relates to this definition of Mexican, specifically Mexican and specifically Halloween religiosity as being kind of a step up from other um, diaspora communities. He characterized his family's practice growing up as orthodox but more liberal. For example, they celebrated Shabbat dinner, but they drove in cars and used electricity. This might be class, uh, many people refer to this sort of religiosity as traditional. Um, again, using sort of someone's terms, it's also incorporated into everyday lexicon. His father um, had sort of departed from uh, communal institutions and was very involved in the International Kabbalah Center, which is a center of Jewish mystical study with locations around the world. These are open to all comers and often very much at odds with organized um, Jewish life. And Salomon Askenazi has adopted, had adopted his father's interest in Kabbalah, as well as his critique of the increasing stringency of religious, religious leadership in his Halabi Comunidad Marie David. So in his earliest films, he wanted to use the medium to get viewers to think critically about Judaism. 
He was inspired to make Jewish Wars for an annual arts festival, festival hosted by Mexico City's <laughs> Centro Deportivo Israelita. Um, a longtime fan of Star Wars, he decided to do a voiceover. He says the symbolism worked perfect. Quote, I've always felt like the religious people are like the dark side. They even wear all black, the black hats and everything, and they're kind of scary. And the norm among Kabbalists is to dress in white. Thus, in his version of Star Wars, the white clad Jedis are the Kabbalists fighting to preserve their way of life against Darth Cohen and his band of fanatics. Now, of course, this is a, a satirical representation. It's very offensive in many ways, and Ashkenazi was the first to recognize this. Um, and I don't necessarily promote this, and in the book I have more nuanced portrayal of uh, Haredi people, but for the purpose of <coughs> exploring his particular critique, we'll take a look at this, a piece of it. And I'm going to briefly look at also his use. In, in the broader manuscript, I look a lot at, of course, how language is used in crafting these critiques, so we'll look a, a little bit at that um, in a moment. No, y lo vendemos en todas las tiendas coche del mundo. Yo le pruebo que se acepte ese arreglo. La regla del agua ya ha sido aprobada y está en proceso de implementarse en todas las ciudades del mundo. ¿Qué pasa si alguien se está muriendo de sed y no encuentra agua coche? ¿Qué hará un judío en esa situación? Si no tomas agua coche, entonces morirás. Exacto. Agua coche o que si no la gente se tome su propia orina. Bendito seas, Ayer, ¿cómo puedes hablar así? No se necesita usar kipa cuando estamos dentro de la yeshiva y adorar. Da cohen, tú ya llegaste un deseo con tu kipa que te cubre toda la cabeza. Y por lo tanto, quiero que ya está la pena. No vuelvas a cuestionar mi atuendo, que sacrificaré el once de Dios. So briefly, this is not the focus of today's conversation. I elsewhere I analyze how he uses various linguistic resources um, in crafting this critique. Um, you notice that the word comunidad was produced comunidad, and that mimics the uh, aspirated T sound that is often used in sort of Yiddish English or Yiddish Spanish. Um, of course, exaggerated here, um, imitating poorly, but imitating the intonation of Talmudic debates. Um, and there's also some elements of Argentine Spanish. It says seisho, which is not a Mexican way to say seio. Um, and he uh, the aspirates his, his S as misma, judío. Um, and so this, this all contributes to, uh, well, it, this reflects uh, certain elements of uh, the, the Haredi peasants in Mexico City. Number one, of course, most of the, the Haredi rabbis, even though they may be Syrian trained, many of them trained in Ashkenazi institutions in um, New York and in Israel. Um, and furthermore, many are Argentine. Argentina served as sort of an exporter of Haredi rabbis throughout uh, the diaspora, especially Latin America. And all of this contributes to um, casting Darth Cohen and his brand of Judaism as sort of a foreign imposition um, on Mexico City Judaism. Um, and of course, using lexical elements that, that many of you are, are familiar with. So this was Salomon Askenazi's perspective on religion in 2008. In 2017, I asked him if his perspective had changed. He told me he thinks it's pretty much stayed the same. Establishing his cafe and his film studio in Colonia Roma, as opposed to the now more centrally Jewish areas, which are in the suburbs in the west of the city. So being located, physically located there and working with people in film, he said has opened his eyes to the world beyond the Jewish community. Nonetheless, although both the nature and location of his work fall outside the typical Jewish patterns, he says, I have a part of me that is very Jewish. I like to live in my apartment in Bosques, which is the, one of the, the areas of a high concentration of Jewish residents. 
I like spending time with my family, going to my grandma's house, all that. So I have like a balance, and I think it's good. His father has opened a new place of worship in Colonia Roma called Shomri Mlaboker. Compared to other Halloween synagogues, it incorporates more Kabbalistic elements, and everyone wears white. It does, however, continue to follow the same Orthodox, uh, Halloween Orthodox rite as in all the other synagogues. I asked Salomon if women approach the Bima, for example, and he said somewhat defensively, no, it's not, it's not reform. So this is sort of, again, these axes of, of distinction in which there's sort of a line that, that, that even the most religious people will, um, or, or the most sort of liberal people will, will, will not sort of cross over to, to um, religiosity that might be considered reform. And while many of his films have nothing to do with Jews or Judaism, he and his fellow filmmakers also find it something they can't completely leave behind. I'm finishing here. Their most recent films feature Jewish characters and themes. He laughs, as much as we, we feel like we're not part of the community or we're not religious, we're always doing things that have to do with Jews. I ask him why at this moment in his life. There's always controversy within the community. Like, one minute you like it, then the next minute you don't. We're struggling with that. All the time. So Salomon is somebody who's been a very active critic of the community, and he defines himself as such. But it is in no way a renunciation. On the contrary, his critique reveals the depth of his commitment. His struggle is not to be free from the bounds of religion and community, but to open up spaces of legitimacy or alternate ways of being Jewish. So in the rest of my paper, I've um, introduced some, some young women who are also going through these processes um, and tracing the, the ways in which they're, they're sort of selecting elements of Haredi religiosity and rejecting others, and often very vocal in their critiques of certain elements of communal life um, to sort of um, add that, that perspective to it. Um, but in, in general, with this work, I do aim to contribute to um, more nuanced views of Shani Khalidi or, or uh, Sephardi and Arab Jewish religiosities. And this is really in line with um, sort of theories of contemporary religion and secularization and anthropology, in which uh, really rejects the, the, the binaries of secular versus religious, modern versus traditional. And also in Mexican social theory, in the um, sociologist Roberto Blancarte, um, in his research on, on Mexico City, or on Mexico, um, survey research demonstrates that, they, that while Mexico is an overwhelmingly Catholic country, most identify with Catholic 85%, and 85% say that religion is important in their lives, at the same time, um, the numbers are saying that fewer people go to mass and more people express positions that are contrary to the Catholic Church for regarding abortion and gay marriage and things like that. And so he also says like viewing um, modern religiosity from the perspective of, of non-North uh, Christian context and non-Western context allows us to articulate and he, he sees from Mexico a notion of secularization that really incorporates more religious diversity that is in no way sort of a, a rejection. And so I, I hope to kind of contribute to these conversations and hopefully bring this to also conversations on North American or U.S. American and Canadian Jewry um, as well. So thank you very much.